Well, welcome to the third week of Lent. And thank you again for joining me on this uh, kind of this path where we are seeking to um, focus on and connect with the journey that Christ took on our behalf. Uh, thankfully, it it is moving in the direction, as we know, of his resurrection and and his name being glorified. Um, looking forward, again, we're still in this period. It's like this Advent thing, right? We are in this period of waiting for his return and full glorification and our own um, full redemption. And we we look forward to that. We were waiting for that. And so in the meantime, we are in this Lent period, this kind of desert, this time of, of death, this time of releasing control, this time where darkness feels bigger than the light, um, though we know that it's not. At seasons, it can really feel that way. And so today, I wanted to ask you a question. We are talking about temptation. And I am curious for you, when you think about the idea of temptation, what comes to mind for you? As a matter of fact, if someone were to ask you how you would describe or what you would say temptation is, what would you say? I think in our lifetime, if we pause for a minute, we can look back and we can name some some pretty intense moments where we were faced with temptation. Whatever it was, it was strong. There was a pull. We were trying, you know, usually your mind tries to rationalize something that you know you uh, don't want to do or shouldn't do. Um, and yet it's it's powerful. And uh, and these are different for us, right? As individuals, there are certain things that really get a hold of me that don't necessarily get a hold of you. There are certain uh, temptations that grip me particularly in a way that probably don't grip you and vice versa. But there is at the very core, a universal temptation that even when you just scan and observe the world today, you can see how primary this temptation is for us. And this is the one I just want to briefly share a little bit about. The temptation we've talked about here and what you read in my email was the temptation to avoid discomfort, to escape pain, um, to kind of sidestep the things that cause us to feel uncomfortable, um, to be self-reliant, to depend on our own ideas, to instead of looking to Christ, for his strength, help, support, and even his own provision, we look to ourselves, right? We seek our own resources instead of seeking his resources. You know, when you think about it, it it's it's quite foolish when you when you contemplate the even the creation around you and that he made all things, but right by the just the words of his mouth. And that even some of these interesting creatures that you see out there, the giraffe and uh, some of these birds out my window that I watch each morning. And I think, gosh, the wisdom, uh, the creativity, the mind of God, um, his power to sustain these things. And yet I go to my broken self, my foolish, unwise self to try to figure out how to do life. Looking back at Genesis, you know, with the very first temptation that we we read about and understand in human history, where God had said to them, "Don't eat from the tree of 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 the in the garden, the tree of life. Don't eat from this tree." And when the enemy came in and spoke to Eve, and she recounted what God said and changed it up a little bit because she then said, well, he told us not even to touch it or we would die, which he did not say. But the enemy's response was this. Did God really say that? And furthermore, he, no, that is actually not what is going to happen. He doesn't want you to eat it because once you eat it, and this is what it said, God knows that when you eat it, and when you your eyes will be opened 
and you will be like God. God knows that when you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this was the original temptation. God doesn't want you to eat that because you have the power within yourself to be all that you need, everything that you need, all wisdom and understanding. Your eyes will be opened and you will not need him. I read one commentary called the Asbury Bible Commentary, which said this, and I thought it was really, uh, I I just, I I like the way they wrote this. Man, as a result of this temptation, as a result of the enemy's words, man becomes suspicious of God. No longer can God be trusted. Sin is no longer destructive. It's actually beneficial. Man's own interests are best served by self-determination. So as soon as the the as soon as the word was given or the challenge was given to Eve, he planted a suspicion in her mind about God. He actually can't be trusted, but you can be. You can trust your own self. You can trust your own resources. No, your eyes will be opened. You'll be able to figure everything out. You will know best and you will know best apart from him. What a, what a true and ongoing for all of us temptation, right? To rely on ourselves. I mean, these temptations we always thought about growing up, don't do this, don't do that. Don't take this. Don't cross this line. Don't, don't go past this boundary. And we would be tempted to do it, right? Even by the mere fact that we were told we couldn't, we would be tempted to do it. But this temptation is so insidious. It is actually praised in our culture today that the more you um, rely on yourself and your own resources, the more you stockpile everything that you need right here within yourself, the more powerful and strong and successful you will be. Really, it's essentially to be your own authority. This is the core temptation, that we would be our own authority. And if you look at the world today, everything comes back to you be your own God. Do it the way you think is best. Do what you want. If you don't like that, you don't have to do that. Avoid this, this, and this. If someone is cruel to you or or you don't like the way someone treats you, you can decide to then cancel them, right? It starts and ends with us. That's where the temptation comes in. So here, I want to just say this quickly, because what does it actually look like to begin to see the evidences of me uh, giving into this temptation of self-reliance? Well, for one, it looks like I hardly pray. So the less prayer in my life, like the less times of prayer, the less the less responses of prayer um, when I'm faced with something and I don't pray, that would be evidence of self-reliance. So that's one that seems really clear to me. The other thing is less and less time in the word of God. I don't actually need it. I don't prioritize it. I have a lot of baggage around it. Um, the word and meditating on the word, the less I do that, the more I'm trusting in what I'm reading, what I'm seeing in the world, and then my own interpretation of these things. Uh, where there are some wounds and scars around scripture, it's. It, I think the best thing is to then kind of let, like move into it, prayerfully move into it, asking God to give you a renewed understanding of his word. Um, I think the other the other evidence that I'm relying on myself is I, I my my first response tends to be a bit impulsive or reactive. I don't pause and pray and think and consider. I I don't really invite other people's wisdom into the scenario. Instead, I trust my own first thought in how to respond to something. I think the other the other one is is. Uh, and this is not wrong. Having money obviously is not wrong. We need money to live and we need money in order to care for other people to be generous. But when we pursue it out of a sense of desperate need for security, 
when we um kind of when we become miser miserly and we we hoard things because we are afraid of what it will look like to lose these things because at the end of the day i don't really know that i believe god will be faithful to me there is evidence there that i am trusting in that support more than the support and provision of god and when i intercept things on behalf of my kids so that they don't have to feel any kind of pain. When I quickly go to my technology as a as a ongoing default habit so that I don't have to feel things too much. These are evidences that I am not allowing myself to sit here in this place and trust that God will meet me. And finally, the last one I think is a lack of practicing the Sabbath. Because I don't believe I can be at rest. I don't believe I can set these things down. I don't believe I can uh, step away from work or doing. Um, because at, at the core place of my being, I believe it's all up to me. This is the temptation that we face on a daily basis. You and I both, and it's and it's very, very natural for us to lean this way. And actually, as I said, we are encouraged to lean this way. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I have a poem that I attached or a little button with a poem by William Culper. Actually, it's a hymn that he wrote, a man who struggled a great deal with depression really all his life. But I wanted to just read you this one stanza <clears throat> from this poem uh, and close with this. I forget the, I forget actually the title of it. God moves in a mysterious way. That's the title. So this is just the, just one stanza right in the middle that I really love. I, I actually would love to memorize this, but let me close with this. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread, are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. This is the trust, right? This is the belief that you will meet us when we remain in the place of discomfort, when we resist the temptation to run and to solve something on our own. This is the promise. You will come, right? Jesus, you will come. I pray this week that as you, as you consider this and prayerfully uh, journal and reflect on this, what are those uh, ways that you are quick to run, to escape, to trust yourself? And let's confess them, right? Let's confess them before the Lord so that he can throw that as far as the East is from the West, because that's his promise. Take care, friends. I hope you do have a good week.